But yet God saw something in us. Even though our path was leading us to the grave, he was there to meet us. And he accepted us and he loved us. And because of him, because of the cross of Calvary, we can cry out, all I have is Christ. He is our life. He is our everything to us. Yesterday, for some reason, I had it in my head that I had to pick up Joel up at um, church camp where he was working. And if you want to get some incredible stories, he's got some incredible stories of how God moved up at church camp this week. And he was a worker. And I had it in my head that I had to be there at 10 o'clock. And I didn't have to be there till 11. So some of you have been up there before. You know what the camp is like. It's a beautiful 58 acres right on uh, the uh, north shore of Clear Lake over there on the west side by Ventura. And um, I got there. I called Carla. I said, what's the deal? And she said, well, you didn't need to be there for another hour. And I'm like, oh, all right. So I just thought, you know what? This is God. This is the, the time for God and I to just talk a little bit. And I walked out on the dock, and I just sat out there, and I watched the boats for a little bit and just, you know, marveled at his creation that he has there. And then I walked around and and just kind of ask God, what, 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 what do you want from me? What, what, what do you want me to do? You know, because I think there's times in our lives, as we're going to see today, where we begin to doubt. Where we begin to wonder if God really is doing what he said he was going to do in our lives. And this is where we find David today. Now, Mark read to us from the end of our readings today of to where David ended up. And we're going to do the cliff note version today rather than read to you guys from uh, chapter 27 all the way to 30. We're just going to kind of condense it down and give you the cliff note version to get to that point where Mark read to us today where David was inquiring of the Lord and he was asking for that ephod. He was asking for that breastplate that had all of the 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Israel in it. And that's what the Levite priest would wear. And so here today, we're going to see David at this point where he's just immersed himself in the culture of the world. This is what he's done. After some scholars, it depends on who, who you read and how they interpret the dates and different things. Because the Bible doesn't really clearly tell us how long David ran from Saul. But most Bible scholars will say it was between seven to ten years from the time that David was pushed out of um, Saul's army. So, you know, about seven to ten years from the time he killed Goliath, and he's on top of the mountain, and he's the man of Israel, and everybody's looking to him. He's been anointed the next king. They know that this is the man who's going to lead Israel into the next generation. And so we're looking at roughly seven to ten years. And what has he been doing during that time? He's been running. He's been hiding in the wilderness running from Saul, and David gets to the point in his life in chapter 27 where he basically just throws his hands up in the air and he says, I'm done. You know, I, I, I don't think God's going to move in my life the way I thought he was going to move in my life. You know, I'm, I'm just going to do things my way. I'm going to, you know, but like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to pull myself up my own, my own bootstraps. I'm going to do what I need to do to protect myself, protect my family. And so he goes into the Philistine camp. He goes running to the Philistines. He takes his own life into his hands. He's going to live life his way. And he gives up for the plan that God had for his life. And we all know people like that. We all know people that we probably used to sit next to in the pews who've given up on God. They just said, I'm done. I'm, I'm finished. You know, something happened in their life, and they just decided, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. I've waited too long. You know, I, 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 I'm X amount of years old, and God still hasn't given me what I thought he was going to give me. He hasn't shown me what he's supposed to show me. I am done. I'm tired of fighting this fight. And they walk away from God, and they run into the arms of the world. They run to the Philistines. And generally what happens over time, their heart becomes hardened. They become desensitized to the things of God. And we see them walking away from God, living for the world. And they end up paying a terrible price. They pay a very high price. And so today, we're going to see the price that David pays. 
Today we're going to see in the life of David why we make these decisions, why we choose to look at the things of God and say, you know what? I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe God is really working in my life. I'm going to run over here to the very people I've killed before and call them my own people. Because that's the choice that David made. We're going to look at the consequences of our choices, and then we're going to see how Mark read to us today, how we can be redeemed and restored by God, even when we make those terrible decisions. So the first thing we're going to look at are the, are the choices that we make. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'm reading from the New King James, about 90% of the time, that's where I'm going to be, is in the New King James. But in verse, or chapter 27, verse 1 of 1 Samuel, we see David making his choice. And David said in his heart, okay, there's the first mistake right there. We're going to talk about that in just a second. He said, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will, will despair of me to seek me anymore in any part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. He was the anointed one. Samuel had anointed him as the next king of Israel. And he says, you know what? I'm tired of this. I've been living in caves. I've been eating whatever. You know, I don't know if he's like John the Baptist, eating locusts and honey. And probably not eating like a king. He you was know, sleeping on rocks, hanging out with him, you know, not taking a bath. You're right, you're right. I'm, you're right. I'm stinky, dirty. And he says, I, I, I've had it. I would be better off. And to go to the Philistines, to the very one, I killed their giant, I killed their best soldier, but I'd be better off to go to them. He began to trust his heart. He began to trust his own judgment rather than rely on what God had done in his life already. He did not trust the word of God anymore. He thought he knew better. He began to trust in his heart. The whole time I was working on this last week, I kept thinking of, um, uh, oh, I just lost the name, uh, Disney, uh, Jiminy Cricket. You know, what was it Oh, he always said? Let your conscience be your guide. That's what I kept thinking of. It's like your conscience, your heart is wicked. Your heart's going to lead you down the wrong path. He began to listen to his heart and to his feelings instead of trusting the word of God. Instead of going back to the one who created him, the one who trained him, the one who anointed him to be the next king of Israel, he trusted in his own self. He forgot about all the great promises that God had made to him. He forgot that God had promised him, anointed him to be the next king. He trusted in his heart. He thought he would be better off living with the Philistines. You should never, never, never Trust your feelings over the facts, over the word of God. And we live in a society today, don't we, that trusts feelings first. Our government tends to govern based on feelings instead of basing them on facts. We are quick to rush to judgment, especially in today's society with instant access to media. But we should never trust our feelings over the facts, over the truth of the word of God. And so we see David here in chapter 27. He abandons God's plan for his life. He thought life would be better with the Philistines. So I'm going to go with them. You know, at least I'm not running around the countryside, living in caves, eating bugs and sleeping on rocks. At least with the Philistines, I'll have a warm bed, food, clothing and everything else. So he goes to the Philistines. He's the future king of Israel and he's running from, from Saul, and he's running to the enemies of God. Okay, I want you to stop and think about that. He's running to the enemy, and he says, please help me. Please help me. Please spare my life from that wicked King Saul. See, David felt it in his heart. It says he said in his heart, he felt in his heart. And when you do that, when you decide, well, I just felt in my heart that you're, you're, you're headed for trouble. Because Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah tells us in 17.9, he says, in the heart itself, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
We see people do a lot of crazy, evil, wicked things. And it comes from the heart. We talked about this before when we talked about the, the race issue that we see around the country and the different things going on. It's, it's, it's not a race issue. It's a heart issue. Because the heart is wicked. And until we can sing those songs like because he lives and understand that he is our savior and that he died on the cross for us and he loves us. And we, he loves everyone regardless of race, regardless of color, regardless of creed. He loves them. He loves you. He loves me. Until we get to that point, we, 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 we can't understand that the heart is wicked. Until we replace it with the heart of God, we don't understand that. And so you have to be careful when you begin to say, well, I just feel in my heart that I need to do this. Or, you know, it's just, it's just tugging on me or whatever it is, because your heart's going to trick you. The fleshly heart will trick you. The fleshly heart will deceive you. It will lie to you and it will take you down a dark path that you don't want to go down. Your heart is going to say things to you like that church you're going to, it's dead. You need to leave. And you'll begin to listen to it. Your heart's going to say things to you like, well, that church is so bad. You know what? You'd be better off if you just stayed at home or you went to a different church that, that was just a little bit nicer. You know, the people were a little bit more friendly. Or your heart's going to say things like, that preacher, he's just mean. That preacher, he, he, he's not positive at all. He's not, you know, professing love. One of the things that I'm going to... Side note here for a second. On Friday, um, that Michael Youssef, he was a, an, an Egyptian, born Egyptian, immigrated out of Egypt in the 60s, came to the United States, made the United States his home, became a naturalized citizen. He's 73 years old, and then he talked about building his church. And this is what cracked me up. He said, he goes, when I started, he goes, we were meeting in an office building, about 1,000 people, small church, he said. <laughs> you guys get it. Nobody else there got it. I got that. 1,000 people, small but there was a, um, a mega church pastor in Atlanta at the time in the 70s. Um, and he came to him and says, you can't grow this church preaching that message. He says, you've got to soften the edges of the gospel. You've got to give people what they want to hear. And he says, I believed him. And he says, so for several years, that's what I did. And he says, and then one day he says, God spoke to me. He said, God just grabbed my heart and said, no. He says, I didn't save you from a certain death in a Muslim country of Egypt to bring you to the United States to preach a compromised gospel. We preach the word. The church has to preach the word. Whether it's comfortable or not, we have to preach the word. Because it's not nice little platitudes and statements that save us. It's the, the brutal fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross. That he was beaten he was scourged. He suffered and bled and died for us. That's the truth of it. And he expects us to live a life, God honoring life to him. And so many times we hear preachers say from the pulpit, it's okay what you do. God still loves you. And yes, you're right. God does love you. But he hates the sin in your life. He can't look upon the sin in your life. And so your heart will lie to you and tell you things like that. Your heart will lie to you and say, hey, you know what? There's nothing wrong if you just want to go out on Saturday night and live it up every now and then. Now, this is not going to turn into I can drink, I can't drink or whatever. I mean, the Bible's clear. This is don't get drunk. And I remember after I first got saved and um, Carla went one direction and I went the other. <laughs> She stayed rock solid. I didn't. And I can remember coming home every once in a while, and she's like, well, how would you feel if Jesus came back right now? You know, I'm sitting on a bar stool. Is that where you want to be when Jesus comes back? You know, so we went to stop and think about some of the things that we do. Your, your, your heart's going to lie to you. It's going to deceive you and say things like, well... God doesn't even really care about you because he hasn't given you the promises that he said he would. Because if God really cared about you, all of these bad things in your life wouldn't be happening to you. You ever hear that one? 
You know, something bad happens. Oh, where's your God now? Uh, still on the throne. I didn't take him by surprise. There's a purpose. There's a plan. There's a reason for everything under the sun. He has a reason why these things happen. He's growing. You, you think David was in that point where his heart's lying to him? Saying, where's your God now? You've been running for almost 10 years. Where's the promise? Your heart will lie to you and say, well, you know what? You can do it just one time. Just one time is okay. It won't hurt anything. Just a little bit. Just a little. It won't matter. It's okay. God won't care if it's just a little bit. See, when you listen to your heart, you're going to find yourself where David found himself. Living in the camp of the enemy. You're going to find yourself making the wrong decisions because you listen to your heart and it leads you astray. We have to be very, very careful of the choices that we make. And then we see the consequences as we read on chapter 27 all the way to the beginning of chapter 30. We see the consequences in chapter 28. We see Saul on his downfall when God completely abandons him and he calls up a medium. He calls up you know, a, a fortune teller to summon up the, 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 the dead spirit of Samuel. We, we see all of these consequences of everybody's sins, of everybody's choices here. And what we need to understand is that these decisions that David made, these choices that David made, affected everybody around him. It said in verse 2 of 27, And David arose and went over with 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Mahog, the king of Goth. And so he took all of the people with him. He took his wives. He took his family with him. And it affects that one decision that he made, because he was the leader, he was the man of the house, he made the decision, affects everyone under him. Paul tells us in Romans 14, 7, for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. Everything that we do, every decision that we make affects the people around us. When a spouse steps out of God's will, it will affect the marriage. It doesn't have to be a physical relationship with another person. When they step out of the will of God, it will affect the marriage. We see it time and time again where people begin to listen to the deceitfulness of their heart. And they go, oh, well, just this one time. I'm on a business trip. Nobody will know about it. But that decision will begin to deteriorate and destroy the relationship of that marriage. When a parent decides to walk away from God and live by the world's standards, it's not the parents that are paying the price. It's the children. The children begin to watch it. You know, I hope my dad understands if he ever watches this and he's seen some of my previous sermons. I became who I was when I met Carla. I became the alcoholic I was and the partier I was because of what I saw in my family. I made that decision. I don't blame them. I'm not saying you caused this to anybody. I, when it comes down to push to shove, I made the decision to, to take the drink. I made the decision to do the things that I did. It's nobody's fault but my own. But when parents decide that the world is more inviting and more enticing than the things of God, the children will pay the price because they will see it and they will emulate it. They will become what their parents are. On the flip side, when a child runs away from God, when a child runs to the world, the parents pay the price and sometimes we say, oh, no, 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 they don't. They're fine. The, the adult children, they're living their own life. No, the parents are destroyed day in and day out from the inside out. It may all look good on the outside. They may keep it all together, but inside they are dying a slow and painful death. See, we never know who's watching. We never know who's back in the shadows watching our life and seeing the things that are going on. We never know who might stumble when we choose, when we choose to walk away from God and listen to our heart. 
I mean, Carla and I used to have this argument all the time because we would go out for pizza or whatever, and I'd order a beer. And she's like, well, you know, you, you, you shouldn't do that. You're a Christian. And I'm like, well, you know, if, if I can, I mean, it, it, it's okay. The Bible just says don't be drunk. And we'd have the whole discussion. And she was absolutely right in the fact that she goes, you don't know who's watching. You don't know who you're causing to stumble. And Paul warns us of that. To be careful of the things that we do because people are watching us. As we go on in uh, uh, chapter 27, we see that David runs to the Philistines in verses 5 through 12. He, he seeks help from them. He runs to the wrong crowd. He was literally sleeping with the enemy. That's what he was doing. He did things, as we read on through uh, verse 12, he did things that he never would have done before. He murdered Outside of the will of God, outside of God telling him, hey, go and conquer these people and do what, whatever it is I tell you to do. He murdered for the king. He lied. He submitted and he bowed down to God's enemies and to false gods. His entire life was completely and drastically changed by the choices that he made and there will be consequences. See, when you walk away from God, it might seem positive in the beginning. It's fun. Sin is fun. It's a good time. But there's always going to be negative consequences that come. Because here's what happens. You're living this life. You're living in the world. You're having a great time. But you'll do things that you've never done before. You're doing it with a crowd of people that you never would have run with before. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 53, he says, Do not be, see, be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits or good character or good morals, depending on which version you read. You can only live in the cesspool of this world for so long before it begins to overtake you, before it begins to affect you. You cannot walk away from God and live a life of sin and not be affected. Ravi Zacharias said this as we look on in, in, in chapter 29. So chapter 28 it is all about Saul paying the price for his sins. And he again, he, he, he goes to a medium, to a fortune teller, and has the uh, um, dead spirit of uh, Samuel brought up to him. And then in verse 29, we see some of the um, more of the consequences here. But Ravi Zacharias, um, who since passed on, great um, Bible theologian, said this. And I, I've said this before. I didn't, never knew that he's the one that said it. But sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. It sounds like fun when you first start. It sounded like a good idea in your heart. And David thought it sounded like a good idea. And then all of a sudden, he begins to pay a price. And he begins to fall about as far as a man can fall from God. And so we see in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 29, he, he, he goes to the king and he unites himself with the Philistines and says, you know what, I'll go and do battle for you. I'll even go and I'll go fight against the Israelites. I want you to stop and think about that. He switches sides here, you know, and, and he, he, he goes to the, to the king and, and he cries out to him. And, and it says in verse 4, but the prince of the Philistines were angry with him. So the prince of the Philistines said to him, make this fellow return that he may go back to the place which you've appointed for him. And do not let him go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become our adversary. So they were un unnerving here. They, they were nervous about accepting David because he's the one that Saul has slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands. They weren't really sure what to do, but he's bowing down before them saying, I will do what you want me to do. But they were like, eh, there's something about this guy. We're, we're, we're just not quite sure. Even they wanted to get rid of him. He was offensive to them. Now all of a sudden, he becomes a man with no country. He's lost. He's abandoned the Israels. Now the Philistines are abandoning them. These are consequences. And so he goes on in verses 6 through 8. 
And, and he grovels. He, he, he bows down to the king. And he says, surely as the Lord lives, you have been upright and you're going and out, of, out of coming in, in with me in, in the army. And it is good in my sight for this day I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming to me. So the king looks at him as he bows down to him and says, you know what? You've done everything for me. So therefore, return now and go in peace that you do not displease the lords of the Philistines. So the king looks at him and is like, yeah, David, you've done a lot for us. You, you, you were united in battle, and I understand what's going on in your life, but he says, you're a faithful servant to me, but you need to go back home. You need to go back home. Then we see to where... Um, Mark was reading to us today in, in chapter 30. He begins to reap the harvest of his wickedness in, in verses 1 through 5. And so what happens is the, um, they come to the community. They come to the town. And the Amalekites have invaded and attacked the city. They've burned it to the ground. They've taken the women and the children. And they've, they've murdered men. They've taken all the possessions. And David now sees the consequence of his decision. He reaps the harvest of his wickedness. He's been retaliated against. And everybody is captured. Everything is burned to the ground. He has nothing left. He doesn't know what to do. And all of a sudden he realizes, this isn't where God wants me. This isn't what God planned for me. And so in verse 6, where Mark started reading today, we see that his own men looked at him and were ready to turn on him, threatened to kill him because they realized that David had led him down a dark path, that David's sin had taken everything away from David and from them. And David goes, I got to get back to God. Because, see, this is what sin does in your life. You walk away, you go out on your own, you do your own thing, and you pay a high price. You pay the ultimate price sometimes. So my question is, is it worth it today? Is it worth your spouse to have that little fling? Is it worth your spouse to step out into the world and do the things of the world? Is it worth your ministry that God has placed on your life to give it up for the pleasures of this world? Is it worth your children? Is it worth your name? Is it worth your health? Is it worth your own life? So you can't walk away from God without consequences. There is always going to be consequences and there's a price to pay and God will have no trouble collecting the price from you because he is a God of judgment. He is a God of righteousness and we will pay the price. Moses wrote in Numbers 32, verse 23 in the last half, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure and be sure your sins will find you out. Before you make that decision, before you make that choice to walk away from God, consider, consider the consequences, consider the price that you will pay. And then we see David restored in the last half of, of chapter, or verse 6 of, verse, of chapter 30. David hits bottom. He has nowhere else to go. He doesn't have the Philistines backing him up anymore. He doesn't have the Israelites backing him up anymore. He doesn't know where to go. He hits rock bottom and he looks toward heaven. He looks toward our living hope today. He looks toward the sky to Jesus Christ. He turns his gaze to heaven and he does something powerful. He repents. He understands of what he's done is wrong. It says, every man was grieved, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. He understood. He gets back to the basics of life. He gets back to what God called him to do. He seeks God. He asks for God's help. He is back in the place where God can use him once again. And see, that's the beautiful thing about David. 
That's the beautiful thing about this whole story of his life because David is just like you. David is just like me. He is not some God that walked this earth and never committed a sin, never made a wrong. He was a man, a full fleshly man and made mistakes. He stumbled, he fell, but every time he did, what did he do? He went back to God. He got back to the basics of it. And that's why God calls him a man after my own heart. See, David shows us what we're supposed to do. He is back in God's will, walking on the right track. He immediately begins to hear the Lord's direction for his life, and he obeys. He's fully restored now. He's repented. He shows us exactly what we're supposed to do when we've allowed ourselves to walk away from God. We are to get on our face before him, and we are to strengthen ourselves, not in our hearts, not in our conscience, but in the Lord our God. That's what we're called to do. See, we repent. We get on our face before God. And here's the key. We deal honestly with our sin. We don't go, well, you know, I'm not as bad as. Man, you ever seen my brother? Whew, he's terrible. So God, you know, I know it's not real good, but... No, we need to be honest before him. We need to understand that no matter what the sin is, God cannot look upon it. He only, you have to understand that when Jesus Christ's blood was spilt, it paid the price for our sins so God can look upon us again. You couldn't pay the price. You couldn't do all of the things of the 600 and whatever rules that were laid out by the priest of the day. But God did. Jesus Christ did. And he sees us through that prism of his son's blood when we follow him. Proverbs 28 says this, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but he who ever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. See, just as David did here, when you confess your sin, God will forgive you. God will restore you, 1 John 1, 9. We all know this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from a few things. Right? That's what it says, a few things. No, it says all unrighteousness, everything. It doesn't matter what it is. He forgives us all of it. So if you've wandered away today, you've wandered away from the camp of God, you've wandered into the enemy camp, you need to know something, that you can't come home today. You can come back to him today. And you will be completely and totally forgiven. You will be completely and totally restored. I want to jump back to uh, chapter 27 and verse 7. David was been out of God's will, not for a few days, not for a few weeks. Verse 7 of chapter 27 says, David, the, the time that David dealt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months, 16 months, a year and a half, basically. He was with the Philistines, living it up, soiling his oats, doing whatever he pleased. Does God look at him? And say, I'm sorry, David, I gave you a chance. You blew it. We're done. I'm going to pick somebody else. No, he didn't do it, did he? He restored him. Does he say, well, hey, David, uh, here, here, here's the deal. You screwed up. You blew it. We get that. And um, I'm going to put you on um, heavenly uh, probation. And you're, you're going to be on probation for a three-month period. And if you do okay, you don't mess anything up, then we'll sit down and we'll talk about this restorative process. We'll talk about maybe getting restored back to what I wanted you to do. Can't find that one in Scripture either. Does he look at him and says, well, David, I get it. You messed up. You made a bad choice. And I forgive you, but things are never going to be the same again. And so, hey, I'm done. No, he doesn't. He forgives and he restores. He restored him back. David confessed and God instantly, instantly forgave him and instantly restored him back. 
When God forgives you, when, when you confess to him, he forgives you immediately, completely. And here's the big one, eternally. That's our God. You look at verse 19, I believe it is, of 30. It says, and nothing of theirs. So David goes back. He, he's going to get back what the Amicalites stole from him. And verse 19 says, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small nor great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything, which they had taken from them. David recovered all, just as God promised him. He says, go, and you will recover all. He was completely and totally restored. Some of you need to experience that today. Some of you are here today and you've been camping out with the enemy for a long time. Maybe you're watching online. I don't know. But you need to experience that grace. And we all make foolish decisions from time to time. We all make decisions that we shouldn't. And we start to listen to our heart, our wick, the wickedness of our heart and the lies of our heart. And it's time today that we get on our face before God and we start listening to his word before it's too late. As a church, as an individual, as a country, we need to come together and understand that we can't listen to our heart. We have to base it on the truth, on the word of God, the scriptures. Because today is the day to come back to God before that price, before that consequence is too costly. If you come to Jesus, if you come to him, and you honestly deal with that sin as Proverbs talks about, and you are honest with him, he will save you, he will forgive you, he will restore you, and you will have eternal life with him. I'm going to challenge you to have that courage today. Have that courage today, either right here, when you get home, in your car, wherever it might be, to have that conversation with God. Get on your face before him. Take care of those needs. Listen to his voice. Quit listening to your heart. Start reading his word and do what he says to do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. For your word, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word today. And I just pray today, Lord, that hearts and lives would be touched and changed by the power of your gospel. Not by my opinion, not by the words that I say, Lord, but by your words, by the examples that you give us in scripture. Let our hearts be penetrated. Let our hearts be changed. Let our hearts be made anew in your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.